Hi, it's Chris Blasey. Welcome to the September -ish edition of On The Move. I'm here with my usual uh, partner, Rich Chekin. Um, tonight, there is a host of things to talk about. As a matter of fact, the biggest challenge for us, there is so much happening in the world and in the marketplace, we have to try to prioritize and keep it down to at least a manageable number of topics. But uh, I'm sure you're not going to be disappointed. We are going to cover really the things that are uh, of the most critical and important to you as an investor. Uh, and this will be across multiple asset categories. So this should be a great episode for everybody. We do have a special guest tonight, Hillary Kramer. Uh, she'll be introduced to you shortly. We'll give you a little bit about her background. But just as a reminder for anyone who's new, joining us maybe for the first time, um, Rich Chekin, my partner, he's from Asset Strategies International. He's the chief operating officer there. He has been with that organization since 1996. Before joining ASI, he's had a really quite an impressive background. He's a graduate of uh, the US Military Academy at West Point, served as an officer in the armed forces, and left the military in 1993 with the rank of captain. Spent a couple years in the financial services industry. And as I said before, in 1996, came on to um, Asset Strategies International and has been a tremendous leader for that organization for these, uh, what, 16, 15 years. Um, some of you who are work with Asset Strategies International may know Rich because he's a prolific writer. He contributes to their newsletter. And for many people who have been active in the investing markets, especially things related to resources and precious metals, Rich has been a constant contributor at seminars and, uh, and other gatherings um, that across the nation and really around the world. So Rich, glad to be with you again here tonight. Glad to be here, Chris. Uh, and for those of you who don't know Chris, and I don't think that's many on this call, but you never know. Uh, uh, Chris uh, is a friend of ASI's for several years now. Uh, we got introduced to him because of a unique product uh, that he was the creator of, patented, and uh, built a company around. Uh, Neptune Global is basically uh, uh, the vehicle by which he offers the unique PMC ounce, precious metals composite ounce to the world. Uh, it's something that we absolutely love here at ASI because it gives instant diversification to precious metals. Chris is the, uh, the mastermind behind that. Um, and that's not where he started. You know, he's been in this industry for 30 years, and I think you'll see the wealth of knowledge come out in the in the conversation tonight, as you have in the past. Uh, he's got experience in financial services and technology industries. Uh, as I mentioned, he's the founder of Neptune Global, but he worked in the past with some major brokerages and some boutique uh, 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 merchant banking firms. Uh, he's got so much knowledge then he shared it with the likes of people you may have heard of Wall Street Journal, Investor Business Daily, Market Watch, TheStreet.com, USA Today, MSNBC. Uh, so he gets around, his opinion is worthwhile and uh, I think you'll see why here tonight. Um, with us as well is one of my newest friends. Uh, you know we, we don't go back a long way just uh, what 2020. 2019. I was aware of Hillary. Obviously, she's uh, I was right. That's that. Yeah, but I hadn't met her uh, until until recently, and I've had the the privilege of uh, being a guest on her radio show, The Millionaire Maker, a number of times uh, as we talked about Gold's story unfolding this year. Uh, but Hillary's been in this industry for about 30 years as well, uh, as an investment analyst, a portfolio manager. Um, Financial Times describes her, and they don't describe me this way, so you know we're dealing with a, a big deal here tonight. Uh, Financial <laughs> Times describes Hillary as a one-woman financial investment powerhouse. The Economist uh, distinguished her as one of the best known investors in America. Uh, she's been quoted in the Wall Street Journal, New York Post, Bloomberg, Reuters. Uh, she's been guest contributors at CNB CNBC, CBS, Fox News, Bloomberg. Um, she's got a number of products out there trying to help people uh, make sense of these markets, uh, including Game Changers, Value Authority, High Octane Trader, Turbo Trader, Two Day Trader, IPO Edge, and Inner Circle. 
and she's the author of three different books, uh, maybe more, I don't know, but I know three, uh, Ahead of the Curve uh, in 2007, The Little Book of Big Profits from Small Stocks in 2012, and Game Changer Investing, How to Profit from Tomorrow's Billion Dollar Trends. And that's a Wall Street Journal and USA Today bestseller. Um, so we're very, very pleased uh, to have Hillary. I will tell you the two things that draw um, – me to both of these individuals that I'm, uh, I've got the honor of uh, presenting with tonight is their passion for what they do, which is taking care of their clients. And it's something that we understand here at ASI as well. And, uh, you know, um, basically I want to start right off with it because we got a lot to cover as Chris said, and our clients do need to get some sleep tonight too. So uh, first off, there's a little bit of volatility little bit of uncertainty going on in the markets. We're seeing shifts yesterday with the NASDAQ was down 4.1%. Today, it's back up again, recovering most of those losses mm -hmm. in a day. Um, and that's not uh, an aberration. That's the norm. Um, what, do you, what do you make of all the action in the markets right now, Hillary? The stock market is beginning to understand <clears throat> that it is possible that we have a win by uh, Biden, and we have a President Biden in the White House uh, come November. And that reality that it's a possibility, and maybe even more than just, you know, a um, uh, minor possibility, has shaken the market because stocks are valued on their future. Um, on their on their future revenues, future bottom line, and immediately we all know that there'll be a 15% increase in corporate tax. So immediately everyone just sticks a different number into their Excel spreadsheet. So no matter what magic they use to come up and you know calculate what a, what is what a specific company's worth worth, it's now going to be worth. 15% less going forward and then compounded. So that's, that's you know, using an example to explain what's happening, but there's so much more than that that's, what ta that's, that's creating and causing this volatility. The market does not like uncertainty. The market oh, We froze up a little bit there. Oh, freeze up. Yeah. So uh, uh, as we're waiting for Hillary, oh, oh we're back. Froze up just now. Yes, yes, yes. that's okay. But oh, you goodness. were saying that the market doesn't like uncertainty. The market doesn't like uncertainty, but the market also doesn't like. Um, the, well, the market is is really driven by fear and greed. So we're now, we were greed, 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 greed after March 23rd and after that, that horrible 25% you know, drawdown took place. And, and since then, and then increasing every day, the market has been driven by greed. So that, that greed drove investors, some of whom had never been in the market before, which is even worse of a problem uh, because the 30 year olds were in college, but even the 34 year old, 40 or 34 year olds were finishing college. Money's been made, they sat around, they weren't working and they just went into Apple stock. They went into Tesla stock and they bought and bought, they were given margin cheap. And, um, and to them it was a no brainer, buy calls, calls on Apple and this is going to continue to rise, you know, and uh, they'll just be able to have a bigger and better life. And then the reality came together and that happened at the same moment that the polls showed that President Trump's um, kind of sort of um, Here's the opinion of the Americans of the coronavirus, not even how he stood Biden versus himself, but the opinion of, of him and trust started to erode. So we had that. We have this uncertainty, not just about a vaccine, but what's even worse, we have uncertainty about whether a vaccine when it comes out can be trusted. And 62% of the country does not believe it can be. So, so that we have all these things coming together and then we had what we call like a whale. We had a, no, not a black swan event per se, but we had a whale meaning something really big under the water. And that was SoftBank, a big massive fund that invests in tech and also 
invest in the market, uh, they were responsible for much of the drive forward on some of these big tech names. They were buying call options and then had to buy the stock and delaying stock and writing options. And so not to get into the specifics of that, but uh, the confluence of all of that came happened at the same moment that the reality hit that there was not going to be a $600 a week supplement to, un to everyone's unemployment. And it was the first time that I know of in history that unemployment was just, not just those who had W-2s and worked for companies, but that, was, that $600 a week was coming to people who had their own businesses, thank you. So that was, thank you, Rob. So that was a major problem. Um, but let me also talk about, you know, what happened with the market. Got another freeze up. Well, we're waiting for uh, Hillary's uh, freeze to unfreeze. Uh, let me flip it to you, um, Chris. Let's talk a little bit about uh, the precious metals action and what's going on, because that's not a smooth line either. Uh, maybe you can catch us up there and then we'll jump back to Hillary for the next Yeah, one. sure. I mean, I'm going to try to compress it. It's really hard because there's so much happening, right? But obviously to the flip side, why we call equities and, you know, uh, maybe gold is negatively correlated. As the equities don't like the uncertainty, precious metals are thriving. Now, granted, I followed this market and this secular bull market started way back in 2001, right? And this last leg appeared to start in December of 2015. It is now just accelerating. You remember, Rich, we've known each other a number of years. I remember in the, as they say, the good old days when the whole story for gold was always just about the debt, right? Mm -hmm. Back in the humble days of 2008, and 9. Now we have a country that literally is now coming apart at the seams and the world is seeing it. Um, and, you know, if, if I guess I can encapsulate something that is perfect. You know, the, the people who were never supporters of precious metals, um, you know, they'd always like to trot out Warren Buffett, right? And this is amazing. And Warren Buffett does make a good case. In good times, in normal times, right? Why really, how much gold do you need to own? It's better to have an operating company, something that's gonna have cash flow, gonna have income. And that's perfect. And he was never a big proponent of precious metals, right? He would always disparage it. You dig it out of the ground. You, put it in another hole and guard it. Well, now we know that he has recently been dumping his bank stocks, buying into Barrick Gold. Mm. And what's that telling you? Now, even he, even back in 2008, nine, he didn't lose his faith. But what it's telling you is he even realizes we do not have the stability right now. And it doesn't look like it's going to be for some time where that model where no, no, just buy into operating businesses is really, is, is that reliable? And is now it's about preserving wealth and protecting your wealth. And you know, I watch guys who are just, you know, there's always guys that just will, will stick to one asset category and real estate's a great example, right? Because real estate has made people fortunes for long periods of time. But right now they're still trying to convince people this is a great buying opportunity. I mean, anyone who's honest knows the commercial real estate market is an utter disaster. It was a disaster before coronavirus. Now it's beyond that. Now, even in residential real estate, people are being told, you don't have to pay your rent. Now, the whole idea of what made real estate a great investment was, right, the income. When the government is basically saying, and the CDC is assuming powers, I mean, and being, and telling people, landlords, you don't, you're not, you can't collect rent during the coronavirus. That makes being a landlord a very dangerous thing. And it doesn't mean you can't get lucky in real estate, but it's the proverbial catching a falling knife. I mean, the tide is running against you. So right now, this is a particularly opportune time for precious metals. Was it good back in 2002, three, and four with everything that was happening? Absolutely, and they performed well. It actually dovetails perfectly in to the, the um, secular bull market where the third leg is the biggest gains with a eventual parabolic blow off. The events happening now are exactly the type of things that support that. So actually, I just marvel that when people step back and look at this market from its beginning to its end with its correction in between, it'll be a text, it is a textbook 
secular market, bull market for the metals. Uh, uh, you, make a, you make a good point, Chris. I mean, bull markets tend not to, within a year, break out and achieve new all-time highs. I mean, that's fast by any standard. Uh, and you can say that it was COVID that threw the kerosene on it. You can say it was government response to COVID that threw the kerosene on it. But the bottom line is, I agree with you. I think this is just the start of something much bigger. Um, and, you know, who knows where it will go? Who knows what tampering the government has yet to do that will affect all these markets and dampen or increase the intended consequences. Uh, but I agree with you. I think this is something a little bit bigger. I do have people, though, when we hit all-time highs. So we're getting a little freeze. Pulled back. They're saying, <laughs> getting started. Uh, but wait to make. Go ahead, Chris. No, I just froze for a second. Yeah. Um, so we could go on. I mean, we could spend hours on that. But I guess something that a lot of people want to hear, and I'm going to, I'd like to go to Hillary on this one. She talked about it a little bit. Do you want to expand and, and finish, uh, Hillary, on where you see the upcoming elections, you know, where we're going? Um, and even, do you think there'll be a decisive enough win where we're still not going to- That, that, oh, that would be in, in my list of, you know, <clears throat> issues that are way- Oh, no. Um, President Trump has already said, it's not even, we can't even, you know, imply, it's almost an inference. He has said, he, I mean, he is contesting whatever the result may be if it doesn't clearly point to him staying in the White House. And I don't want anyone to think that I have any political leaning one way or the other. My job is to make you money, right? That's what I do. Whoever's in the White House, I want to figure out how to, for you to buy the right stocks, make the right investments, make the right call in how you allocate your portfolio, which is why I'm here today. So, so anything I say, I'm not doing it to disparage anyone. I'm just saying the facts, which are that we could be in a very nervous point, just like we were in 2000, where up until inauguration day, uh, Florida was, you know, was counting up, you know, what was they flying chads? Hanging chads, pregnant chads, yeah. yeah. The court had to decide who was going to be president of the United States. And that was a time when I can tell you there was uncertainty in the market, but what we really care about, what makes the US stock market continue to rise? It's not just what happens here. We are seen as security, as safety. The US system, our um, Securities and Exchange Commission, our gap you know our, our accounting principles are at the highest level the values morals um the the lack of corruption in the united states is extraordinary in comparison to other countries and that's why we attract capital if <clears throat> if someone is sitting in a country that has not yet emerged meaning you know <laughs> it's not the us it's on germany you get the point and sees that it's not clear who's going to become president and President Trump is saying, I'm gonna bring in federal marshals and we have, you know, we have rioting in the streets. We are going to see an, a, a horrible dip in our stock market. We're gonna see selling, it's gonna be selling from the people abroad. They start selling, including our treasury bonds. You know, if a country holds, you know, $10 billion of US treasuries, and they say, no, I want treasuries in this, in, I want Swiss treasuries, I don't care if I have to, that I pay to keep them in the, you know, that I get pay, they don't pay me a treasure, they don't pay me an income, I pay them, but at least I know it's safe. Uh, we're talking, you know, that, that this is going to be total chaos and mayhem, and I have to say, um, gold, precious metals, will rise immediately. I mean, they already have been, and uh, Rich can talk to the unbelievably beautiful, you know, arch upwards of gold, hitting that $2,000 an ounce, and there's a reason why. You follow the Fed. The Fed's gonna leave rates at zero, and it, do that for an extended period of time, according to Powell last week, chairman um, uh, of the Fed. 
if, if he's going to be doing that and yet treasuries are going to be sold off, right? And, and these bonds are being sold. In a big way increase, too, if you believe it. In, increase yeah. and the cost of, and then of course, 30 year mortgages are tied to rates on treasuries. And suddenly the one thing that's keeping this market going, which is this ability to buy a house, right? This is, this is, um, this is, you know, non-commercial real estate. Once that, um, seizes up and you combine it um, with what Chris said, which is that the commercial real estate market, office buildings, retail, warehouse, you know, maybe everything except for self-storage units like that PSA owns, it is, it is going to be a bloodbath, a complete and utter disaster. So I'm here to say, you know, what do I do? What do I recommend to the 250,000 people that receive my research, that subscribe you know, to, to my market commentary, which always has stocks that I recommend or options that I recommend with mm. need for diversity, because we also do portfolio allocation. We're going to be highly, highly diversified into both cash and into gold. And gold comes in many different forms. Um, and uh, gold, silver. And so that, that's why this is so exciting today to talk about this as a group. Usually, you know, the gold people are over there at a conference. You know, that's, that's what people point. are over there, right? <laughs> but it's not like that. It's a pie. And that pie needs to be divided up so that everything can work in unison, can work together. And understanding that Anytime you are ever concentrated, anytime I've ever been concentrated, when I say concentrated, like meaning I put a ridiculously huge amount of money into an investment opportunity, usually a stock or an option, it never works out. It's just the law of nature. It never works out. The only way you can make big money is by being in. Oh. Was Hillary, a, you're freezing up a little bit, but that's okay. I'm going to pick it up from here because I think you're hitting on uh, the answer, if you will. I just want to make a couple comments. Um, you know, uh, you both mentioned about the the commercial real estate. And, you know, you, over, you always heard that phrase, you know, if they build it, they will come. Well, it's been built. They're going away, and I don't think they're coming back. Um, mm -hmm. You know, uh, the, the economy's got some issues. I think we have political, I think we have social issues. I, I still remain an eternal optimist. I don't think we're going to see a bloodbath or, or rioting in the streets. I, I hope we don't. Um, I think people will understand the greater good, have a conversation. It's something that I wish we could have in DC. Uh, we haven't had it for years, Chris. You know, I've two years ago, we were talking about this, the dysfunction, and it's like nobody knows how to compromise or to, to work with each other across the aisle anymore. It's just my way or the highway. And that's just the wrong way of doing things. Um, I don't discount anybody's opinion. I take it all in and make up my own mind. And, and I try to meet people. Um, so we need to see more of that. I still think it can happen. But I do think we're in some very uncertain times. And that kind of is the crux. I, I want to just make one comment. You know, anybody that's read our stuff over the years has heard the analogy of the three legged stool right? Um, it's, uh, you know, Glenn Kirsch, you know, rest in peace, uh, one of our dearly departed founders uh, always used to talk about this. And he said, listen, you can't stand, you can't sit on a stool too well that has one leg. You can't really sit on a stool too well that has two legs. You need three legs to be able to, to sit you know, with any sort of stability. And where, where he gets that from is your portfolio shouldn't have all of your assets in any one currency, right? Because then you're subject to currency risk. Uh, you don't want to have it in any one uh, country. So you don't want to suffer just uh, focused on jurisdictional risk. Um, you know, if, if everything is in one country and they have a coup and they nationalize the assets, you're screwed. You know, so you can't have it all in one country. You can't have it all in any a one asset class or investment. Okay. So we absolutely believe in diversity. And it's funny you made the comment, Hillary, about, you know, the gold people are over here and the, the, the stock people are over here. It's like a high school dance. Um, I, I went to this one conference that was primarily attended by stock folks, right? And I was the gold guy. 
Um, there were two of us actually there, but I was, I was one of the gold guys and he walked by, he's kind of looking at my booth, trying to figure out what the heck our name meant. And he's like, you guys are the gold guys. I'm like, yeah, he goes, oh, no, I'm not interested. I'm like, can I just ask you why you're not interested? And he said, you know, I, I love, I love my dividend stocks. And I'm like, oh, that's great. I like dividend stocks too. I have a bunch. And, uh, I said, uh, you know, what is it about the dividends? He goes, I just like getting those paychecks, you know, and, and reinvest in the, the assets. And I said, okay, well, just out of curiosity, um, before you just completely discount gold, did you realize that in the last 10 year bull market, 2001, 2011, gold was up 650%. Silver was up a thousand percent. So that's what a hundred percent or 65% a year. I said, are you getting that much in dividends? And he like, it doesn't matter. I just like my dividends. And he walked away in a huff. You know, it's just, it's that mentality and it's not a zero sum gain, is it? Chris? No, no, it's not. Um, so, yeah, that's a great story. And it's, uh, you know, I've had these conversations with people that just dug into their ways. Um, you know, it, it, it's, that's, it's even like, that's what's happening in the whole country. I mean, facts don't mean anything. Everyone's just dug into their positions. But um, I'm just going to, you know, expand on, on the precious metals. Um, you know, this is, um, this is a, a unique time for them. I mean, a great example, we just brought a new guy on board. He's one of our, he's a trader here. And he, he's 25 years, he was a bond trader. Okay. And, you, you know, not many of those type of guys come to precious metals dealers, right? And, you know, he was with Morgan Stanley, he's with TD Ameritrade, right? Uh, but, you know, there are so few options for investors right now. When you have this level of uncertainty, you know, when you're no longer just expanding and, you know, there's, there's basically a somewhat of a free market. There's never been a total free market. But when what's happening here in this country right now in our economy with major asset classes like commercial real estate, and a lot of people don't even realize the ramifications of when the commercial real estate starts to freeze up. I mean, your insurance companies, your pensions, where do you think all that money is? That's in class A office buildings in Manhattan and, and Dallas and, and Atlanta. And what's happening right now, what the coronavirus did is, or the events right now took trends that were in place. Yeah, there was the slow migration to more work from home, but you know, there was still that legacy. Most people are gonna come into the office and you still have the big places like Morgan Stanley with a massive home office right there on Broadway. And now it's just accelerated every trend. Mm -hmm. Now with six months, this is a long time where almost every worker is working from home. Companies are realizing, you know what? We can do it now. And whatever little efficiencies are lost by them not being in the office, we're gonna more than make up in saved costs for real estate. I had breakfast with a good friend of mine this morning. He works for one of the major insurance companies. They asked them, they're polling the employees, do you want to come back to the office? And they're all coming back and saying, no. A couple of things. First of all, they said, if you want us to come back and tell us that I can't get within six feet of my coworker and I got, what's the point, right? I'll just stay home. So the point is, we have now set things in, in, in motion that are crippling certain asset classes, right? So for back to us, there is limited places for, places for people to put their money. Our, our trader from the bond market, he's like, there's no yield. I mean, going out five years for less than a per, half a percent. I mean, what's the point, right? So, you know, and dividend stocks, you know, they've been bid up and, and they'll do better in a downturn, but you know, a lot of them will get hit too. Some very good ones. I mean, I own some, some, you know, utilities that have gotten hit. So, um, you know, we're in a special time for the metals. It's a, it's truly the life raft right now. And it's just part of a, a portfolio. I'm never going to be, you know, and I respect both of you guys because you're 100% right. It's not 100% in any asset class. That's the great way to get yourself blown up, right? Um, now, you need to be enough in an asset class where the position in it is going to materially benefit you as that asset class does well, but you should never be a gambler. And as much as I love the precious metals and I'm comfortable with them, you know, wouldn't gamble everything on it, right? Um, so I'll flip it back to you. But uh, yeah. Yeah, as far as the three-legged stool and such, and to Hillary's point, yes, you need to be logically diversified, properly weighted, but, um, but it's just more challenging now, you know? And, 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 
and folks like Hillary can help people in times like this. Because it's not, it's a rising tide isn't lifting all the ships anymore because the tide really kind of isn't rising. Um, it's kind of running out. <laughs> and now you have to be, I think, a lot more savvy um, in your positions. Sounds like our right life raft needs a captain, Hillary. Uh, can, <laughs> do you know anybody that could guide us through these waters? I have a few ideas on that. <laughs> um, He's here. Okay, but one, no, no, but it's not a but. One thing I would like to revisit is the part about what could go wrong that leads me to be so emphatic about being diversified, about, about having enough cash, having enough gold or silver, or gold, silver. And again, I leave it to, to Chris and you to you know, talk about the different ways that are, are possibly the most appropriate for each individual to, to buy into gold or silver or precious metals. Um, but it's absolutely a necessity. If for no other reason, by short, you don't want to be up at night worrying. If you know that 25% of your portfolio is in some kind of mixture of cash, coins, you know, precious metals, um, you'll never worry. Even if you're 75%, the rest of you are in equities, you'll always be like, it's okay. It's okay. And then you won't act irrationally because acting irrationally is why we buy at the top and sell at the bottom. Yeah. So I wanted to bring Doesn't make us money. <laughs> the other point is, um, you know, kind of keying off of, of Chris, he mentioned the pension funds. This is the first time that we are in a situation where there's going to be more pain. And that's because the states are bankrupt for the most part, absolutely bankrupt. So when, there, when one talks about a pension fund, you take a New York City cop and he's retired after his 25 years and he thinks and he gets 70, they get 75% or 50% of their income, you know, of their last two, of the average of their last two years working. They will tell you, that cop will tell you it is in solid stone, it is in stone. Nothing will ever change that check that I get. It will never. It's guaranteed by the federal government. Let me tell you, when these pension funds, that's why it's such an important word, public and private pension funds, especially the public pension funds used and taken and, you know, for other purposes, mm -hmm. not as protected in some ways, of course, we are talking about a bloodbath in this country. We are talking about, you know, maybe a hundred million people. And I'm not kidding you because we're talking teachers, sanitation, police, fire, planners, controllers, motor vehicle division people. I mean, it is inspectors, surveyors. It is unbelievable how big and grand the, the, the number of government workers there are, when those pensions are cut and you combine that with the fact that there is no gig economy, meaning that this gig economy, the expression really just means, you know, you find a, a gig, you know, you find something to make some money on the side. That's the concept of you get some gigs here. And, um, and, and those are gone for those over 50. Up a little. Oh, there we go. Since 2008, 2009, right? Since the financial crisis, everyone got kind of knocked out. So what I wanted to say is the reason you want gold, and I'm just going to talk to gold, is that we are going, again, we're going in uncharted waters. We are entering a time where people who thought that that check is coming every month, no matter what, guaranteed, it's going to be cut. It will be cut. We are going, to, and, and when that happens, that group of people, either you are in that group of people, but you invested well and you have money and you're part of a couple and there's a lot more money out there. Um, so you are either in it and struggling and shocked, or 
you're just an investor, an individual investor, and suddenly every stock all over the place is being like dumped. Homes are being sold, cars stop being bought, and and the and you know renovations stop. Home Depot and Lowe's suddenly gets very very quiet. Then the trickle down is going to be so severe. And anyone who wants to debate me, I will take you on. If you think <laughs> that you know, uh, I don't want to. I don't want to pick on one. But Dallas police and fire that 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 those pensions you know are written in stone. You know, San Francisco teachers. Hey, the, you know, the Roman Iowa Legion. The Roman Corps. Legion thought it was written in stone. <laughs> what? The Roman Legion thought it was uh, written in stone, and so did the uh, generals in Russia or the Soviet Union when it collapsed, right? They thought, oh, I was Right, right. And so what do you need? You need gold. You need gold. You need dollars. Um, you need to have your powder dry. You need this sense of security. And it'll also make you a much better investor. You will, you know, so if you still want to be in that stock market, and I hope you are, because that's what I do, you are just going to be a better investor. It'll make you better because you can sleep at night. And, and that trend of gold, the beauty of it, of, I'll just call it the precious metals, is that there was a time when it meant only, I think you, you had to buy a bar of gold and you kept it in your safe or, or coins. Now, here's the beauty of it. They're all different uh, vehicles for being invested in gold or gold, silver, and the precious metals. Now, that's a, that's a good point. And uh, I was going to ask, but you you already got to the answer. I was going to say, how did that turn out for the Roman legions? You know, it's it's interesting, Hillary, that you brought up the, uh, the pension funds. You know, I remember, I want to say it's like 10, 15 years ago, speaking about this at conferences, writing about it. Um, back then, to me, it seemed all too inevitable. Um, and I just wasn't sure when it was going to happen. I didn't know what it was that was going to be the trigger that set it into motion. But I mean, th there's state and local governments that have really been broke for years. Uh, and, you know, the, the concern was, how are they ever going to pay these people? And I don't want to create a widespread panic or anything like that. But, you know, back then, I thought if they had taken steps then, right, with being able to see this coming, they could have eased the pain you know, people that were already retired, they say, okay, we're going to leave it alone. You're going to get a hundred percent of whatever was promised. You know, people that were getting closer to retirement age. So, okay, okay we're going to give you 80%. You know, people that were a little further away, you're only going to get 70. They could have done something to kind of phase it in and ease the pain. And now all of a sudden the curtain went up, the emperor's got no clothes. Of course, if he had an ounce of gold, he could have bought a nice new suit way back to Roman times. <laughs> but, uh, you know, the emperor has no clothes at all sorts of different levels, government corporate and otherwise well you know your point the pension issue is huge because such a huge percentage of this population relies on that income right I mean and it's a no-win situation I mean it's actually a win situation for gold either way I mean unfortunately the you know the events um, that are driving gold are not necessarily something we, we want to embrace but to Hillary's point we're just talking facts right it's like you don't deny yourself a life raft because you you don't have to talk about the possibility of your ship sinking. It is, it is sinking. And to your point, Rich, you know, I, I know back in the 80s, coming from a state like New Jersey, which was, you know, it's one of the states I live in. Something which, the three of us share, by the way. Yeah, I know. I, I do that because I'm I actually- I call it really, the motherland affectionately. So. I, I'm a Florida resident now, but I still go back and forth. But I mean, New Jersey leaves the, the nation in corruption and, and underfunded pensions and triple dipping. I mean, it's obscene what they do. In, and Jersey tomatoes. Yeah, well, they do have that, um, good ones but um, and they have nice beaches. But um, the point <laughs> the is, <shore. laughs> you're, you're going to get what you're going to end up with. The pensions is this: either the courts rule come in and say that the states and municipalities can declare bankruptcy. I think they call Chapter Nine and start cutting all these pensions, and that's going to con con really put constraints on spending power, right? So your economy is going to be completely horrendously impacted by less money going out to the literally 100 plus million retirees over the next you know, 20 years. Or they just start printing trillions on trillions to bail them out, which will cause a lot of anger, 
I mean, that is the path they will take. take There's the no question. It's going to create inflation. It is going to corrupt the value of the dollar. The dollar won't have the value that it did. We're already seeing that start right now. And that is, and I, and I just, hey, I sound doom and gloom and I'm known for being like, people love me. I'm like the rose colored glasses woman, you know, bye, bye, bye. March, March 23rd was a Monday. I was on Reuters, you know, buy, you got to buy stocks. This is the big opportunity. And was I ever right? I mean, you could have bought, you know, Apple at 80 and then watch it go to 150. I mean, it's just incredible, the numbers um, on, on every stock, you know, but suddenly it is very interesting. I don't want to, I'm not going to go down this path, but you know where I'm heading at. Fires in California, burning out of control, multi-billion dollars of damage. The insurance companies are going to get killed. They're going to get hurt. Insurance companies are some of the biggest investors in bonds and stocks. Absolutely. Many people don't realize that. That So when I was an investment banker for many years, and you go on these road shows, and you say, okay, we're bringing Jack in the Box. That's something I... Oh. We're talking to insurance companies, life insurance company, you go up to Hartford, you go to Scotland, you, you know, so they're not going to have any money. Then you talk to foundations. You, you go and you visit Harvard and Yale and Stanford and the UC California system, and they're not going to have any money because so many students aren't returning or aren't going to pay, I mean, because of coronavirus. Um, you have um, the, the, the anger that's brewing on, in, in sort of urban areas across this country have made it that it just kind of is feeding on itself. So people are leaving, so then it becomes more dangerous. The thing you never want are empty stores, right? You never want an empty strip mall, ever, right? A landlord will do anything not to have one empty store. What happens when only two or three still are in there? They're, they're gonna leave too. And then you combine that with the unknowns that just happened. Um, uh, uh, the coronavirus, coronavirus came out of nowhere. And, um, and then it's also even odder. Now, just so you know, I'm in New Jersey today. I live in New York, but I'm in New Jersey at my house here. And I've since two o'clock in the morning as has everyone because we had an earthquake at two minutes and 22 seconds. I mean, 2.22 in the morning. <laughs> And it was scary. That's one of those unknowns, natural disasters. It happens, it happens. So there are a lot of building and because corners have been cut, take Boeing, for example. And I don't wanna take all our time. I feel bad to be talking to these specifics. Corners have been cut because everything started working so fast and, and, and everyone has sort of demand, the, the demand for, production for arrival for inventory, right? Demand request inventory, on-time inventory creation became so fierce that you have a company which is the, one of the best companies in the entire world, the smartest, everything from engineers to sales to operations. Uh, Boeing, what happened? They cut corners because you have to cut corners today to save money and you put in a lot of these technologies that a lot of these technology companies that are who have, you know, like cloud-based, that'll make sure everyone talks to everyone and then you can get rid of entire departments within, you know, finance and treasury and administration. Well, guess what? You know, it made it, it made it worse. And so it's just feeding on itself. So I would say we have all of these pressures that are coming together and eventually everything's cyclical in life. There's that cycle. We're going to be in a we're going to be in a bull market. It's going to be roses, and it may be five years from now. It may be two years from now. It may be even twenty years from now. I mean, there was a bear market, right, um, from you know nineteen sixties until nineteen eighty two, and then a bull market eighty two to two thousand, and then we went through bull bear, bull bear, bull, you know, and um, so we'll be fine. But right now, it's those that can survive what we're going on right now. They have to survive it. You got to mentally survive it, 
and, and the biggest pressure anyone has is, do I have enough money? What am I going to do? Combine all of that with the fact that we can actually live till we're 100. At 56, I could live to 100. Uh, you know, and so, so everyone in a group that, ex, that, that now we can live, how are we going to support ourselves? How are we going to pay for all that we need? We'll probably need new teeth if we're going to live to 100, <laughs> even if we're healthy and live to 100. So how are we going to pay for it? So I just wanted to explain what, the, you know, what it looks like out there. And the default has always been gold, yeah. gold having those gold coins what do people pass down to their kids so to me it's it's absolutely something that lets you sleep at night it can very well increase in value based on what rich explained it's not like gold is you know is is always going to be trailing every single other vehicle of investment there are times that we're going to go through where gold actually will outperform and there are times it might be flat kind of heading down but you know what it always comes back as well as some of the other metals that are used for as well industrial purposes so when some of those are bought and then economies return you, there you can have uh, you know sort of the double whammy of, of those increasing in value as they do so for right now Everyone has to really understand that and know that what you're seeing at home, at Home Depot and Lowe's, and I just actually bought two new cars. And uh, when I picked up one of them, I couldn't believe it. there were seven people picking up at the same moment I was scheduled to be picking up. How many times have you gone to the car dealership? There were seven cars. And I know because you get this bouquet of roses with this particular brand of car. Um, and seven. So I guess with me, it was eight. Why? We're freezing up a little, but, but oh, go ahead. go ahead. It's just been floating. There's been money, <laughs> money, money. Whether it's your $600 a week plus your $300, so you're making $900 a week for 14 weeks, and so is your partner, and you've never had that much money, and you're putting decks on, you're, you know, leasing cars, buying cars, you're, you know, spending money. And now suddenly it's going to be gone. This $300 from FEMA that President Trump has been able to obtain and, 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 and provide to the states or allow the states to use, that is for nine weeks maximum. So that's the only point I want to bring up. Get your gold, put all of your, you know, you know get your house in order and get ready for what's coming because it's obvious that it's in front of us. It's just that because so much money, over $4 trillion since the coronavirus yeah. began, $4 trillion has been pushed into, into the economy. It's been pushed to every level of the economy, not just trickle down, but it's going to dry up. Yeah, there's nothing backing it up. Okay, so that means that eventually, not immediately, all right, so I get two questions all the time, and we do have one question I want to jump to here. Um, but uh, we get, I get two questions all the time. They, you say that uh, there was all this monetary expansion, 2008, 2009 financial crisis in the aftermath. Why don't we see price inflation? I would wager that we see it. It's in the stock market. That money went to the banks and brokerage houses. It was never lent out to the individuals and they invested the free money and made a lot of money. They were on the brink of collapse, of annihilation. And now they're some of the most profitable companies in the country. That didn't just happen. Right. The government gave them a bunch of money. I, I can give the 60 second summary that I always give. $900 billion, so just, just remember now, we have 4 trillion that got sent out. 900 billion was like never heard of. 900 billion was given to the banks for them to loan out to Main Street. They it didn't happened. loan it to Main Street, they loaned it to venture capital, private equity, investment banks that had principal investment divisions, and it was free money to go out and buy assets. The stock market, yes, started to bubble. So we had lots of inflation. We had an inflated stock market, as Rich just said, and we created a class in the United States of the very, 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 how do you put it? I call it like the working billionaire. 
or worth, you know, 50 million to a billion, right? They're not, they're not Jeff Bezos. They're not in the top of Forbes. And there they're are, doing few, okay. there are a few thousand of them, but those few thousand, let's say there are 10,000 people who have about between 50 million and a hundred million. There are 10,000. If the number, if, the, if we hadn't had an 800 billion go and stop at the bank level, we'd have a whole other, we would have a working middle class, uh, upper middle class and upper, upper middle class. We don't, we don't have it anymore. I agree. Yeah. When that question was asked, we do have inflation, yes. Yeah, I agree with you. And, and then this time around, because the money is being dispersed a little differently, right? We're handing it to corporations and the payroll protection plan and other things. We're handing it to individuals, $1,200 a month plus how many kids you have. And, you know, uh, so that money is getting down in the hands of people that are going to eventually spend it. The problem is right now, everything's closed. They, they gave us money and they closed everything, right? So so you've got and built up spent, inventory. <laughs> yeah, well, that's true too. Yes, everything is closed, but with what they did have, that's why Lowe's did well, Matt did well, but restaurants closed. These places exactly. where they could not spend it are toast. And now that we're on the next level, which is this money's dried up because everyone, you put some money in people's hands and they're going to spend it. That's so what now we do. That level is, I mean, now, yes, now it's going to be everywhere. People can't spend and businesses are going to struggle across the board. And, and it's going to be. Yeah, so I, I do see this a little bit of deflationary period switching into a recessionary period if we haven't already done that. And then I see the inflation eventually jumping on top of that. I see stagflation yeah. like in the 70s. So I do think we'll see it in a more mm -hmm. traditional means this time. The one question that was asked so far from Linda, uh, it says basically, um, if you haven't bought into gold yet, is it too late, number one? And at what level would you start? Or would you, I'm sorry, would you stop buying in for fear of it being too high, I guess? So you want to start off, Chris, with this one? I have some thoughts. Sure. So, okay. Is it too late to buy? No. And that means the gold, silver, and the other platinum and palladium. Um, a lot of, well, I won't take it from my projections and I won't give the numbers, but if that individual does some research and looks into people like the Jim Rickards of the world, people who have forecasted this market 15 years ago and have been spot on. So my recommendation is follow the guys who are right 10 years ago about where we are now, not the ones who said gold would never go up and now they, they claim that they understand this market. They're projecting far higher prices for gold and silver. And as I said, I'm not a chartist. I only like to look at charts to confirm where I believe my forecast is and where things are going. And a secular bull market like that's playing out right now for the precious metals point to far higher prices for, for gold and silver. Now, what's the top number? Well, you can't say that right now. So many variables. But what you do is you put yourself in a position where you can also you have divisibility within that position, right? So where you can start to scale out, you know, and just as an example, I'm not saying that these numbers are the numbers, but say you were to enter the market here and, you know, luckily you're going to get in at right around $2,000 an ounce, which I believe will be a, people will look back five years from now and say, gee, I wish I got in at 2000, but say you start to climb and you're up at 3000 plus. Yeah. You can start to take some of your profits off the table. That's what a good investor does, right? You don't sit there because no one knows the top and no one knows the exact bottoms, but you do your homework, you see where the trend is going. I remember there was a great quote from an investor, I forget who it is, so unfortunately I can't give him the credit, but someone said, what's the key to your success? And he said, I always leave the last 5% for the next guy. Meaning, I'm not smart enough to know, but I got in early, I stuck with it. I also see investors that make the mistake of they start to get a winner and they get out of it, mm. right? I know some people that bought precious metals and real very astute got in at a 1100 an ounce, 900. And now they're selling because, oh, I made this money. And the answer is, where are you going? And the metals are just hitting the stride that the guys who understood this market were talked about, right? This is the, this is the warm up. 
And I'll just have to say one thing because I remember, it, and this is, Hillary may appreciate this. When I worked in a traditional broker dealer, meaning stocks and bonds many years ago, someone said, you know, the biggest thing that defeats investors is their own psychology and their emotion. That's the problem, right? Mm -hmm. They can do all the homework and they can understand and they know charts, and, but they can't put it into practice because their emotions kill them. And they said, the reason most investors will use stock as a good example. Investor, most investors, unfortunately, and this is why they need a professional, is they end up with a basket of losers. And the example is this, they buy five stocks. Three go up, two go down. What do you think most people do? They sell the three winners, oh, I made money, and hold on to the two losers because they're like, well, I don't wanna sell it until I get back to where I paid from it. Yeah, you don't wanna lose. Yeah, they don't wanna lose. So then they- <laughs> well, That's they absolutely up. right. Right? That's the way, that's absolutely the way it goes. And they hang on to the two losers so that they substitute the three winners with three other stocks. Two of them are good, one's bad. Of course, they sell the two winners and eventually you see where this is going. They A wonderful portfolio left. You just want to return. Don't get married. Don't, don't care whether it's in this stock or that stock or this asset or that asset. But they sell out on a winner. They want to capture, say, look, I made money. And then they have, so the point is, you know, to those out there in precious metals, if your convictions, if you, if the research is telling you you're going to believe it's going higher and the number is far higher than here, yes, you can pr create a portfolio where you can start to take your profits off the table, but don't panic. Don't let a, don't let a, a and don't forget the metals are volatile, like all markets, mm -hmm. it's even the stock market. You know, how many people, right, just got spooked in March, right, when equities went down a lot and stuff. Oh, God. And, uh, and metals went down and look at where they are now from March. So right, and I, I, I do want to add something that is, I think, kind of vital, which argues, which is why you want to have gold. I'm not even talking about gold. Think about China and 1.2 billion people. We're always thinking how different they are. They're over there, you know, like they're the enemy. Well, you know what? There's someone just like you right in China and to them, they have even more fear and gold has even more meaning in China because for centuries they were around a lot longer than we were. Um, so expect that countries are going to start buying, people in other countries are also going to be starting to buy gold oh, they're doing, yeah. in, in large quantities. China has never had uh, upper middle class or well, I guess what do they have something like 2 million millionaires something like that or 3 million millionaires of their 1.2 billion people yep. um, and I'm sure that then there's dozens of billionaires too well those millions of people are going to buy gold and then the group of you know the billion that don't have they're going to put whatever the you know if, if they have seven thousand dollars that they've saved their whole life don't be surprised if they put it into a piece of gold, yeah. you know, so they can be on the move quickly, so they can cash it in. Um, you understand that's what, and India, I mean, India is, is, is goes without saying, of course. Yeah, India and China are typically the two number one consumers in the world. And you said the, you know, the, the different countries are gonna be buying gold, they've been doing it. I mean, if you were watching the central banks uh, and, and following their lead, they've been buying gold actually and ramping that up over the past several years. Um, I, I just gave a talk on this subject, Linda, um, at the, the Money Show last week. And uh, basically the topic of the presentation was how not to miss the top for gold and silver. And basically I, I take this for what it's worth. It's my opinion. It's stead me well for the past 25 years here. But um, I look at gold and silver um, and to a lesser extent, platinum and palladium, they're more industrial driven. Uh, but I look at gold and silver, the monetary of the precious metals as uh, two buckets, if you will, in my portfolio. The first bucket is what I call wealth insurance. Okay. That's the store, store of purchasing power for uh, in a very liquid form for potential financial crisis. You hope you never have. I at all times maintain 10% in gold, maybe a little tiny bit in divisible silver for, for barter, which I never think will happen, honestly, um, but mostly in gold, it's my wealth insurance, okay? I maintain that allocation, I never ever sell it unless I have a financial emergency. If I do, I don't hesitate. I sell it immediately, meet the financial uh, need and then as quickly as I can thereafter I try to build back up my wealth insurance so I don't have a home without you know insurance I don't have a car without insurance I don't have a portfolio without insurance 
Okay, that's that's my my backstop. Um, that's the way I deal with that. That's 10% for me at all times. Okay. In bull markets, not all the time, but in a bull market like we see right now, I allocate maybe another 10 to 15% of investable assets in precious metals for profit. Okay. And this is where you don't want to miss the top. The other one, I never care about the price. I don't care. It's valued at 250 an ounce or $8,000 an ounce. I'm not selling it. Okay. For profit, I rebalance that like I do all my other speculative holdings, okay? So whether it be six months, one year, whatever the case, I look at it and I say, okay, I allocated 10% to gold and silver. And I actually weight it towards silver for, in these markets, but I allocated 10% and now it's worth 20%. I sell half. I don't hesitate. There's no emotion. I just do it. And I do that all the way Okay, and I maintain that allocation. And if you do that all the way up, you're never gonna go broke taking a profit and you don't care if you miss the top. The only critical part of this is wondering if it's the top or if it's a bull market dip, right? Okay, is this the real thing? You know, if you remember Sanford and Sons, I'm coming Elizabeth, is this the real thing, right? Um, the way I look for that is I look for a whole conflagration of events. I wanna see interest rates climbing. So now there's uh, opportunity cost to holding gold. I want to see if they're expanding the money supply or not. Guess what they're doing. Um, I want to know if they're creating stimulus out of thin air. I want to know if sentiment is dropping. Or actually, I want to know if sentiment is going crazy. You know, if you, the shoeshine guy, the cabbie, the little kid down the street are telling you about the profits they made in gold and silver, it might be time to start exiting that position. I want to look for a gold silver ratio. How many ounces of silver it takes to buy an ounce of gold? I want to see that come down to about 35 to 50, somewhere in that range. I want to see at least a 10 year mark because the bull markets, since we decoupled, have been about 10 years long. We've seen two of them. This is the third. Um, uh, I want to see some political and social stability as opposed to something that might generate fear. Uh, I want to see the kind of returns that we've seen in previous bull markets, which for me is probably two to three times the previous bull market high, roughly, as a, as a gauge. Um, I want to see if debt's coming down. I want to see the dollar rising. Right now we have a dollar index that's below 95 that suggests bear market. I want to see it in a bull market. So I look for all those things. If I get one or two, I don't think we're coming to the end. If I start seeing seven, eight of those things start popping up on the screen, then I think it's not a dip that I want to embrace and buy into. Now I think it's uh, the, the beginning of the end and I might want to start looking for the exits. Any thoughts? That was brilliantly said, I have to say. It really was. And um, you just made my night, my Hillary. You, you said that was brilliant. I'm, I'm, case, I want again, to just die now. <laughs> <laughs> no, just kidding. My, my I do not want to die. Now. Stocks. I'm not as a spot stock person. I find them early, I follow trends, get them early. In my book, I'm not saying to buy my book, but in my book, I have a chapter. This, this was published in hard copy in December. I, in my book, I talk about a pandemic that's going to come and what the effects are going to be of that. I am known for being able to see what the future is going to hold, not because I have a crystal ball, but because I have the ability to see what's happening and put the pieces together. Think outside so, the box. So I got to say, this is the time on stocks, you know, your favorite stocks, income stocks, you, Apple isn't going to be three trillion of its two trillion dollar market cap. Pick your points, but make sure you have your powder dry. Make sure you can sleep at night. Make sure you're diversified. And me, yes, me, you know, I am going to be buying gold. Right? Okay. I said, Rich, I want I, to get I agree. Gold. No, I said no. that to you. I, you did. There's I no did. question I'm about worried. it. I just hadn't had a chance to call, but I'm going to put <laughs> some, you know, real money into gold. And in my case, I'm not even looking for appreciation, just so you know. I mean, you're, you've made like. a great argument and yes, and gold is appreciated. I'm looking for that security and because when everything goes down, it starts to, this is what we say in the hedge fund world, it correlates to one, meaning if you think you're un. 
and General Mills, which makes Cheerios, and then I have Qualcomm, which makes chips for Apple, you know, Apple handsets. Well, you know what? When the market goes down, and it goes down bad, and goes down 70% peak to trough, like in eight, you know, 2008 to 2009, they're all correlated to one. The one thing that isn't correlated is gold, it, are the precious metals. Those do not fall and end up at the same exact place as everything else does. Yeah, typically not. Um, if you look at bull market to bull market, just like within a bull market, you see the stair steps and that's just healthy. And it's not gonna stop as long as we measure gold with fiat currency. Um, there was a question out there and I'm not really sure what it is. Maybe you guys know. Um, if not, maybe whoever asked it can clarify a little bit more. It was an anonymous attendee. He, he said GSMs, question mark. Anybody wanna jump into that? If you could, sir, ma'am, if you could just uh, elaborate on that, I'll monitor and, and we'll hit another question first and I'll come back and see if we can answer that. Um, here's a question I think for Hillary. What are the best types of stocks to own in the given current environment? <laughs> uh, the best stocks are the income producing value stocks that have not in any way participated in the market, but are tried and true, and they've been around for decades and will continue to be around because they have a place. Let me give you an example. Valvoline, VVV, Valvoline manufactures and sells you know, oil to make, you know, to change the oil in your car. You can buy it, put it in yourself, you can buy advanced auto parts, but you can also go to their quick lube places and get windshield wiper replacement and, um, you know, an antifreeze. Now, it's very important to get that 2.2% dividend yield. Why do I love Valvoline? Because car sales were down 30% the last quarter that we had, 30% as of June 30th. We'll see what happens at September 30th, down 30%. Are people flying on airplanes? No, 80% down. People, you know, Americans flying, you know, domestic or international. What does that mean? They're in cars, they're not in new cars, and they have to get oil changes. And they're going to go either to these kind of quick lube, instant oil change places, or they're gonna go and do it themselves. 2.2%, that kind of stock. Let me just give you the Russell 2000 value index. Not the Russell 3000 is even worse, but the Russell 2000 value index is down over 12% on the year, right? NASDAQ, is still up and including today, it's up 27% of the year. So you can, it hasn't participated. And yet, if you look at like sales numbers um, and growth, you would see contraction on most of those tech company names and you would see true growth on others. 3M, you can get a 3.6% dividend yield, MMM, they're in Minneapolis. Yes, they invented the post-it note, but they also make medical care equipment. They're the ventilator and mask people. They're also the, um, the ones that are making, you know, a lot of the sanitization equipment that's being bought to um, sanitize and um, on the highest level, all the public places, schools, and they're in everything from adhesives to orthodonture. So I love 3M, MMM, they really have a place. It's not like just buying an industrial company. You know, it's really buying a company that has incredible uh, d diversity. God, they, they make paint protection films, electronic connecting. Okay, I also like companies like Olin, O-L-N, small cap, you know, billion dollar valuation, been around since 1870, I think, or 1872, you could look it up. They make uh, Winchester ammunition. They own Winchester ammunition. It's a 6.6% .6 dividend yield. That ammunition is bought by the police departments. It's bought by the military. Um, but they also um, chlorine and all of that I thought was interesting. I thought, what's that used for? All of that is in everything imaginable, you know, from our paints to our cosmetics to our um, equipment to 
fillers that might even go into vaccines, okay? And so those are really great companies to own. There's another one, Cronus out there, K-R-O-N-O-S. That one I was reading about, it's 101 years old, and they make titanium chloride, which makes things white. So your toothpaste is white, your face cream is white, your paints are white, your vinyl is white, because of this one company that supplies it all, you get a dividend yield. That's where I'm going. Lastly, you want to be in these gold sacks, GS. Who do you think is going to be running the bankruptcies? One of the most lucrative parts of banking there is. There's nothing actually really more lucrative than doing a restructuring of the U.S. Post Office or doing a restructuring of Brooks Brothers and Ann Taylor. And I mean, it's, you know, there are dozens of companies that have gone out of business, J.C. Penney, because it's not just restructuring, they also have to handle the bonds. And it's like putting Humpty Bum Dumpty back together again, because it's not like the company just borrowed from like 20 people. It's all over the place. It's been all cut up and divided. It's very complicated, but they're also doing cross-border mergers and acquisitions. There was just one that Siemens had in the healthcare um, division. Um, they actually, there's another one, Siemens and Abbott. We're talking about We're freezing up a little bit. In the meantime, uh, Gary came back and he um, clarified. Oh, gold, yeah, gold and silver mining stocks. And that's what I thought it might be, but I just wanted to make sure. Do um, you want to <laughs> comment right. on that, either Hillary or Chris first? Rich, go ahead. You know, you okay. So, so obviously that's not my area of expertise. I'm not an equities broker. I'm not an asset manager uh, for resource stocks, but we obviously pay attention. It's part of our industry. Um, yeah, I mean, uh, we are publishing our newsletter information line tomorrow. So the September issue goes out Thursday morning. Um, and there's a great article in there from uh, Adrian Day, who's one of the, the trusted resource uh, uh, folks that we go to and have for many, many years. Uh, so he's talking about what a wonderful time it is out there, not only because gold and silver are starting to build some momentum, uh, but also because the mining stocks and, you know, some major companies like Barrick that, that Buffett just bought into and a few others, um, they, uh, he basically says that not only are they, have they done well over the past few years, um, but they're still way way undervalued. So Gary, take a look at that article tomorrow. The one thing I will say, and, and Adrian actually uh, touches on it in the article, is he says, you know, listen, make sure you understand that you own no gold. Okay. And that's what a lot of people don't get. I mean, 25 years ago, when I first started uh, working here, I would get phone calls and I'd say, okay, how much do you have in gold? And they said, oh, I got 5%, 10%. I'm like, great. What form do you hold it in? And they said, I have Newmont Mining. I'm like, okay, you have nothing in the way of gold. Now, it's a great company. I have uh, resource stocks as well, um, and I love them, but I make no mistake, that comes out of an equities allocation, not out of your gold allocation, because when you own a gold miner, you own no gold. You own shares in a company whose business it is to mine gold and return that profit to, hopefully they make one, to investors. Um, but you don't own any gold. So, you know, I, I've actually take issue with a lot of these articles coming out. Buffett's in gold. Buffett has bought no gold at all. He bought Barrick, okay, which is fine, but don't make the mistake. It's not gold. Same thing with ETFs. You own shares in a trust whose job it is to mimic the gold price. And you, as a trustee, own no gold. Same thing with SLV. So there's a lot of, a lot of misunderstanding out there. People haven't dug into it. Just understand where those allocations come from. But by all means, I would include them in the portfolio now because you do have the option, even though you have other variables that gold doesn't bring to the equation and silver doesn't bring to the equation, you have, you have to worry about management and environmental issues and indigenous personnel and everything else. Um, but you have the ability in this bull market to get leverage returns as well. And that's something gold can't give you. So I, I just have to add to that. I mean, at the end of the day, a miner is still an operating company, which is yeah. owning the asset, right? And People have conflated, and there's been a lot of um, stockbrokers, wealth managers, whatever, that in order to keep their asset, their client's assets under management, if the client talked about buying gold, said, well, we'll just buy a mining stock, right? Because he just wants to keep his AUM up. 
Um, so that's, you're right, they're completely different assets. You don't own gold and silver with a miner. Um, the other thing is ETFs, right? They're not all created equal, but the two 800 pound gorillas are GLD and SLV. And I would suggest anyone who goes into them and doesn't understand that they're really nothing but a short term trading vehicle to track the price of gold. And that's why their, their, their perspective says track it, not own it. And if you read through the risks, it would make the hair stand up on the back of your neck. That you, and You'll I, get in the fine print if you have trouble sleeping at night. I can't believe so. that the, the SEC allows this to be sold to the public because they're just very upfront about it, right? About all the things the fund doesn't do as far as ensuring that there's any metal there. Also, it does talk about holding it in unallocated form, which means they never bought it. And there is no cap on that. It's not like up to 5% could be unallocated. So the point is, if you understand how Wall Street operates, that means they know I could be 100% unallocated. I'm still within the, you know, I'm still within what I'm allowed to do. So the point is, it's a short-term tracking instrument for, for, it's great for trading in and out of the market, right? So if you just want to trade gold because you think it's going to go up $20 this week and then go back down, you know, that's great. GLD, perfect for that. If you're looking for a store of wealth, it's not the thing. It's not gold. Yeah, it's not gold. It's not silver. Um, and, and I just have to say one other thing because yeah. I've made this projection for years. At some point, you mark my words, GLD and SLV are going to sell at a discount to gold. Yeah. Right? I can see that happening. So supposed to, and I'll tell you why. If you look at what's happening with the COMEX and you look at what the LBMA did last week by all of a sudden opening up the number of quote unquote refineries that they consider are qualified to be good delivery, it's a sign of utter desperation that there isn't enough metal. So now all of a sudden, 100 plus refineries that before weren't considered up to the standards to be LBMA approved gold are now overnight approved. Well, Chris, you don't think that they've been, you don't think that they've just been doing due diligence for years and it all just came oh, yeah, together yeah, at this one it. point. Come yeah, on. Two decades work, well, they just wrapped it all up. And all of a sudden, now that, like, I ask you, I don't want to own that. If, if all of a sudden I see someone say, hey, look, I have a bar from this refinery that, out of China, of all places, that is now all of a sudden LBMA approved. I mean, do you really want it? Or do you want to stick with the ones that, you know, you've been doing business with? So my point is, it's a sign, though, that the, the stress in the physical market is so extreme that, like when Hillary talked about before, we have a fragile economy because of all the corners that have been cut, right? All the maintenance that weren't done at utility companies, you know, and now it's all those chickens are coming home to roost. Well, now they're doing it in the metals. In all honesty, to me, the, the, the ETFs were just created in the mid, you know, around 2004 to compete with money that was flowing out to the physical metals. And a lot of them, now they're not all created equal, I'll give them their due, but the big heavyweights cut lots of corners, just read the prospectus. And now with these new rules about what qualifies as good delivery bars being relaxed without, you know, what you, the due diligence that must have gone into to be on the list before, that's telling you corners are being cut, make sure you actually own the metal that it's in a, a vehicle where the metal's there and allocated and, you know, and, and don't go for and get, and get caught up in some of these things that look convenient and easy to buy. But when you, when you look below, the reason they're convenient and easy to buy is because lots of corners have been cut. You want to add anything to that, Hillary? I got another question as well from uh, yeah, Michael. Very, very briefly. I just want it to be, to be really clear that, I mean, I'm always on, last week, this week, next week, Fox, Fox Business, I do Reuters, I do Yahoo, um, I'm on CBS. I have heard nonstop for all these years that GLD, that ETF, is backed dollar for dollar by gold. I have heard that come out of the mouths of, you know, sort of like, you know, representatives of you know, the investment world the talking heads of finance and investing. So yep. I want everyone to like just understand what Chris just said. It is not backed dollar for dollar. If you buy $100,000 of GLD, you do not have $100,000 of gold at today's price that's sitting in a vault. And I swear I have always heard people who are very highly respected say that it is. Yeah, no, that's... That's a very good point. So, you know, I usually ask people, 
that think that, I say, okay, then if GLD is one tenth of an ounce of gold, why is it almost never one tenth of the spot gold price? If SLV is 10 times, a share is 10 ounces or 10 times the price of an ounce of silver, why is it almost never 10 times the price of silver? Well, it's because there are physical constraints. There's a manager because there's something to manage. Okay, they have physical constraints. The, the bullion banks, I think it's for silver, 10,000 ounces, for gold, 100 ounces. They won't let them buy any less. That's the bare minimum. So if you have all these point and click people buying and selling GLD and SLV all day, and you have to buy 5,000 ounces of silver or 50 ounces of gold, you know what? You can't do it. Okay, so you, eat, you have to make a decision. You're the manager. Where's the market going? What's the, the flow, the trend, the sentiment, and everything else? Should I? buy 10,000 ounces of silver and be long five? Should I buy 100 ounces of gold and be long or should I not buy either and be short both until the next day starts trading and we see what it brings us? So there, there's something to manage there. There are some issues involved. My biggest issue with the, the fine print is you have no rights, basically. <laughs> the, the trust is protected very, very well, I got to tell you, but you have no rights and you own no gold. That's why you can't take delivery of it. I, I still don't have a problem with it. I think it's, it's a much easier vehicle for, for you know, institutions to deal with. Um, so I, I think they, they flock to that and I think it has a purpose. I, I do love the fact as a metals dealer of all the in, um, interest it's attracted to the gold market since its inception in what, 2003 or something like that, that wasn't there before. But I also understand that there's a big downside. Um, Gone are the days where it takes time to settle a transaction. Okay, you can do it in the blink of an eye. Um, so it will, it has caused incredible volatility that wasn't there to that extent prior to the advent of ETFs. So I, I don't have a big problem with it as long as you understand what you're getting into with your eyes. I do, I do have to, I, I do I'll have just to. Let, leave one thing, how I use it is I'd rather be in that because it leads to our next question and I'll go back to you, Chris. Um, I'd rather be in that than in dollars when I exit a position in my portfolio and I don't know what the hell I want to go into next. I'll jump into GLD or SLD. Go ahead, Chris. Well, I'll, I'll disagree a little bit. I think GLD is, like I said, it's good for short-term trading, a day, a week. But if you're going to hold GLD for a year, a couple of years, um, it's, it's, to me, it's just the lazy person's way of being in the precious metals market. Give you that. It, it has, it's, there's no good merits to it at all. If you read that prospectus and you look at the right, you have zero rights. They, they say they do not order the, audit the custodians at the metals there. How hard could it be? Why, don't, why can't they go and count the bars? Why would you allow someone to say, yeah, I'm buying gold, I own it, and I bought it from someone who's a sub-custodian, but I don't go and check if it's there or not. If you look at, if you, with the history of what goes on on Wall Street, especially in the precious metals world, and knowing the sentiment toward the metals market by those institutions, and you would sign on and buy something issued by them, that gives you a document that says, we don't check to see it's there, we can have it unallocated, you know, we're not responsible if it's stolen or lost, that's what it says, you have zero rights, and you're right, it says you have zero, you have no recourse no matter what happens with that fund, right? Absolutely. Just, you know, gross, nothing. I, you know, again, except for short-term trading, for the average person to take their hard-earned money and think that's going to be their store of wealth and not just a, a three-day, four-day, one-week trading instrument, I don't think it's good. I, I don't think so. Um, Tell us how you really feel. It's my personal um, opinion, right? <laughs> No, I, I get it. And I know where it's coming from. Somebody that's passionate about delivering what they say they're going to deliver. That's what you guys do at PMC well, Ants every day. Well, I just have to say, I'm passionate about the beauty about the precious metals market is if you look at most investors, well, all of us, when you're investing in almost every asset class, virtually every one, I mean, real estate, you can buy the property. So that's good. But you are always forced to be relegated to buying something that's been securitized and not actually own it, right? You know, when you say, oh, I bought shares of, you know, 3M, I'm an owner. You're not an owner of 3M. I mean, shares aren't in your name. It's called textbook, but try parking in the executive lot, right? And tell them. <laughs> so my point is the beauty and, and, you know, the beauty about the precious metals is you actually, it's one of the only things where that individual can actually be in possession of the asset. 
you know, if you want to play the oil market, you really can't. You're not going to put a silo in your backyard or have drums of oil. So my point is, since it's the only asset or one of the only assets that you can truly have that kind of control and take all that counterparty risk away, and GLD is counterparty risk to the nth degree, I think, I don't, I think people are doing themselves a disservice to say, well, no, 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 I don't want, I don't want to be in total the captain of my own ship. I'm going to again go with a Wall Street creation. Again, just my feelings, but there's so few, there's so few investments that you have that kind of control. And I just think, at least in this asset category, take advantage of that. All right, I got two questions uh, uh, from the audience. Uh, one was a chat from uh, Michael. He said, um, and I'll go around the horn, uh, this is for all the panelists, where do you buy your gold and silver? But before you answer that, um, there's another question from Linda. She said, listen, I'm, I'm a bit confused. What form do you buy it in? Where do you store it? Do you hold on to it? Do you let someone else hold it? How do you know that they have what you have? So she's a little confused about the, the process of, of investing in metals. So um, start with you, Hillary. Where do you buy your gold and silver? I hope I, 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 hope I like well, this. Well, I mean, the answer is obvious. <laughs> I go to an expert, you, right? There you go. And I say, <laughs> okay, I want to have this investment. What's the best way to do it? What's the safe for me? What's the safest way? I don't need access to it. I'm not putting in selling it. So whatever my parameters are, I would I would turn to you because I'm not the expert on that. Gotcha, um, Chris. Well, I deal with a reputable dealer, and you have to deal with a firm that's in these markets for years and understands, right? So when Hillary talked about people that she highly respected going on television and completely not understanding what GLD is. Therefore, it's like, unfortunately, you may love your wealth manager. When it comes to precious metals, don't waste your time because they don't get it and they don't want to get it. And they will spend all their time telling you not to go into it because they're talking their book. So my point is, for this asset, you have to go to a firm like Riches or myself. This is all we do. We understand the nuances and there are lots of nuances. And unfortunately, there's also lots of people that I don't think do a great service to the investors because there's so little knowledge in this market and they tend, they may lead them astray. And the answer of, do I store, do I take delivery? What form? It isn't so much that which metal or what form it's in like coin or bar or, or fully allocated storage account versus delivery. It's not that one is right and one is wrong. It's your situation and your circumstances. Correct. And Rich talked even about something earlier, even diversifying amongst different, different places, right? Because depository storage has a lot of advantages, right? It's insured, it's safeguarded as long as you're in the majors, the type of people that Rich and I would deal with. And also you have the ability to on a dime call up and sell. You don't have to package it up and ship it back. And then there's other things where in your possession, you know, in your home is advantageous. So the point is you want to talk through someone who will talk about it, you know, with a lot of knowledge and is going to do it in a way that they, they truly want to do what's best for you and have a win-win situation. So reach out to the right people, you know, don't go, you know, your, your, your general wealth manager is not going to be helpful, unfortunately. And it's, That's not, good. it's not to be disparaging, but you know, if you need a specialized surgery, you don't go to the GP, right? You go to the specialist, right? And this is specialized asset class. Think about it. If you're if you're an asset manager and you get paid by assets under management, why on earth would you send assets away? None of them are going to do it. They rather stick it into GLD, stick it into SLV. It's part of the portfolio that they're managing, and they say they got you gold. They, you got no gold. Okay. Um, so just keep that in mind. Chris makes a great point. Uh, I'll just give you a couple pointers, and you know the, the biggest thing is Chris had go to a trusted dealer. All right, we've been around 38 years. Uh, I got to tell you, if we were bad people, we'd have been found out long ago, okay? Chris has been in, in the industry on and off for 30 years, and he, he felt so passionate about it. He formed a company, uh, you know, uh, a number of years ago and, and developed an incredible product uh, that, that we support as well. Um, so, you know, those are the types of people you want to deal with. Um, I'll give you a couple pointers. When, you, when you're looking for somebody, and I don't think you have to need, look any further than the people on this screen, but if you did want to look, and I encourage you to do so, um, just to make sure you're happy, uh, 
I ask a couple questions, okay? One is how long you've been in business. Um, Two is, can you give me some references? Because uh, people find somebody they, they love, they want to talk about it. They're not cowering in the shadows, okay? Um, three, and this is actually the first question I ask every time. When it comes time for me to sell, will you buy it back from me? If the answer to that Great question point. is no, get out. Okay, there are a lot of firms that will sell you and usually it's some sort of collectible modern issue private minted stuff right and they'll tell you, it's got incredible upside potential and then you ask them, you know, where can I sell it back when it's time and let's say well you, you should take it to auction or something we don't do that because you'll get a much better price at auction. What they're saying is let me translate either they put no value at all on what they're selling you. And in that case, they should just give it to you, right? Because it's free. Or more likely, they are too embarrassed at the horrific premiums they are charging you and they don't want to be exposed for them, okay? Answer is number two. Run, don't walk to the exits. If you get, if you get a no, I don't buy back answer. Uh, two, um, I told this to my dad years and years ago. I, I wish he would have listened to me. Um, when I started working here, I said, dad, if you ever, if you ever, buy uh, precious, or if you ever see somebody advertising precious metals on television, don't buy from them, okay? At a minimum, call me up and ask me for an opinion or what could I could do, can I get the same thing for you? They're spending so much money, same thing with like four color, beautiful catalogs and brochures. They're spending so much money on all of that marketing material and all those marketing venues. Where do you think that money's coming from? It's not coming from small premiums that they, they cut down to give you a great deal. They're charging you, okay? Go, go someplace where they take care of you. I bet and, that and is such a great point. I mean, it's, and, and it's the same for me. I'm not running commercials to sell my investment research and my portfolios and my stock picks. Actually, people see me because Reuters and Bloomberg want to put me on and Fox want to put me on and hear my opinion, that's, that's how everyone knows about me. But there are plenty of infomercials and commercials about programs and, and uh, equity, you know, equity investments that you can do with a person and how well you'll do. And yeah, what a great point. Yeah. And then the, the very last thing is, you know, I, I know this is one of the first questions that ever comes out of our, our, uh, reps mind or mouths when you call up and usually people call up and say I want to buy gold if you ask that question or you say those words and, and the dealer you call says how much um, I, I think they're not doing you a service I think the first question they should ask is what for what's your motive what's your purpose what's your goal and your objective until they ask those questions get a feel for your assets and how much you're looking to protect and things of this nature they have no business answering the question or selling you anything um so again that's something we do i know chris does it as well there was another kind of follow-on question i'll just take care of it because it's kind of specific to us it says if i buy metal at the perth mint some so a very reputable company we've been working with uh, uh since god before i got to the company 25 years ago but if you buy metal at perth mint is it uh, do you own gold and silver or is it like an etf like a gld or an slv and no um, perth mint if they sell you metal it must be 100 percent backed under their control at all times it cannot be used as backing for derivatives for financial instruments. It cannot be uh, leased to third parties and it must always be 100% backed at full market value at all times. Uh, no matter what form of metal you buy there, you own physical metal. And you know, Chris makes a great point. Uh, I always start out when you buy metal, take delivery. All right, you gotta have something close at hand for that emergency. If you have an emergency and you can't reach the gold, what the heck good is it, right? So I think you start there, but at some point you feel like you're covered for a foreseeable short-term need. And at some point you feel uncomfortable storing anymore or safeguarding anymore yourself because it's the cheapest way to store metal till it's lost or stolen, then it's the most expensive way. Um, I encourage you to spread it out geographically into different institutions and put it in the hands of the professionals. That's what they do for a living and they're really good at it if they work with folks like Chris and I. So, okay. Uh, I see another question. If you guys hang on, I just, I'm adamant about answering all the questions. Um, I, I, I'll stay on and, until tomorrow morning if you want me to. 
Ah, uh, good question. Um, sorry, Hillary, it's not a stock question, but it's, I have, I have one other question for you that I've, I've highlighted, but it says, uh, how do I own uh, precious metals in an IRA? And actually with the PMC ounce or with gold, silver and platinum and palladium since the 1997 Taxpayer Relief Act, you can own precious metals in your IRA. Okay, so it could be a rollover, Roth, self-directed, SEP, whatever the case, you can own metals. Not every trustee administrator does it, okay? There are a handful that, that um, administer those types of IRAs because they took the time to learn how to handle it, basically, is what it comes down to, and they found partners they could trust to help deliver it. Um, we have a list of all the people that work either with Perthman certificates or PMC ounce or, you know, just physical metals that we deliver to the depository for the trustee administrator for your IRA. Uh, anything you want to add to that, Chris? No, it's just I think there's specialized uh, IRA administrators for the physical metals, um, you know, we, we work with a number of them, just like Rich does. There are certain ones that are very specific for if you go with the PMC ounce, and that means the precious metals composite, which is a diversify. You own gold, silver, platinum, and palladium. Um, and that's a, because it's a real inventory of actual all the bars, not electronic blips. There's, we, we, we keep it down to only a couple administrators because a big inventory has to be managed. So uh, that's, these are some of the things you, these are some of the, um, hard parts when you're dealing in something physical with logistics, but they're, they're, that's how you know it's real because all this is going on behind the scenes. There's constantly metal being shipped in, inventory, allocated, you know, tagged in the client's name. Confirmed, so, acknowledged, shared with you, et cetera. Yeah. And, but if you, sp if you speak to either Rich or myself, you know, we will introduce you to the IRA administrators that handle physical metals. Absolutely. And Hillary, uh, I'll, I'll let you start this one off. And I think this is probably the last question it looks like that I see on my screen, if I can yeah. dig it back up again here. So it was, uh, what do you see as a long-term fate of the U.S. dollar? And that one was asked by uh, Mary. The U.S. dollar will lose its value. It's inevitable. We're at $4 trillion in debt right now. We're going to Past, there's going to be another phase five of the coronavirus act and it's going to be something between 1.5 trillion and 3.5 trillion and rates are going to have to be low in order to pay that debt back but there's too much of it out there the dollar is going to do the, that the strong american dollar we're not going to have it mm. I, so I just would i just would add Sometimes when people hear, you know, the dollar is going down, it doesn't mean it disappears, right? It just means its purchasing power is going to be tremendously diminished, which is ha it has been happening. I mean, it's been happening since the creation of the Federal Reserve, right? So it's not like 1913. It's, yeah. it's just that I, I, I would maybe, I don't want to be presumptuous and say that Hillary agrees with this, but it's just going to be an accelerated depreciation and you're going to have less and less purchasing power which is why other assets like equities and, and gold and silver and precious metals are coming into their own, right? Um, and probably, and I understand, and I'm not an expert in other commodities, but there's other commodities that are going to do probably very well too in the future um, because things are turning where the, a lot of physical hard assets or, or, or companies like 3M that are putting out certain types of products that are going to be able to have the power to have the price increases they need to make up for the devaluation the currencies are being paid in, right? And that's kind of why you, you want to do what you want to do with investing. Gotcha. And um, I'll, I'll just say this. Uh, I think there's there's two things that are going to infringe on the dollar. One, it's something that we've seen over and over again in history. And it's just, I, I'm a firm believer that governments get into power um, by buying the favor of the public. Uh, and at some point, they start losing a grip and they want to buy more favor, even if they don't have the money. And we've seen it in ancient times with clipping of coins, or, you know, what we're doing right now with just running the printing presses because we can uh, as the reserve currency. Um, so I do see that continuing. Um, I, Hillary knows this. I've shared it with her, her radio listeners. You know, my, my adage about the ruler, the measuring stick for length, right? If I take a 12 inch ruler, I measure my desk, I 
come up with six feet, uh, my desk's not that big, but if I come up with six feet and then the next day I cut an inch off the ruler and I measure it again, I'm going to have more than six feet. But is my desk any bigger? Right? So my, my problem with using the dollar to measure value is it's not a stable, consistent measure of value. Gold is. We should be measuring dollars with gold. We should measure milk with gold. We should measure a tank of gas with gold because that's a stable unit of measure in terms of purchasing power of goods and services. The other thing is we, we continue to screw this up, this monetary experiment, experiment known as the US dollar. The world is getting very tired of us. I was going to comment earlier where China's looking to sell 20% of their, their treasuries. Can't wait for that to happen. Um, who's going to buy them? right? So we're going to see the dollar lose its currency, reserve currency status, which guess what? If you don't understand the implications of that, your standard of living goes through the floor, okay? We really got to get people in there that are fiscally sound. Um, otherwise, I'm going to make a prediction here. There's going to be a new index out there that you can track to see the demise of the dollar. It's how quickly Hillary changes the name of her show from the millionaire maker to the billionaire maker to the trillionaire maker. You're not going to have any more money, but she's going to have to change the name just to keep up with it all. I just have to add one thing, you know, Hillary made this great point before when you talked about countries like China and India being big buyers of gold because of their recent history. They understand instability. The one, the one detriment to us here in the U.S. is it's called normalcy bias, right? For most people, we've never been alive in a time where we weren't the leader of the world, we weren't the reserve currency, we had all these advantages. And people by nature think that never ends, right? Like when Hillary pointed out a pensioner on the police department saying, oh no, I have a contract. My government, my state government says I am guaranteed. And it's like, you got to understand your history. That means nothing, right? They can't guarantee anything. Um, ask, are, ask Great Britain, ask Spain, ask, uh, you know, Greece, ask Rome, you know. Exactly. So, ask so, TWA pilots <laughs> and flight attendants. Yeah. So, yeah, I um, mean, how the mighty have fallen, but it's just a reality, right? That, but so for a U.S. investor, you have to realize you don't want to be victim to a normalcy bias because your perspective is life that you experienced in the 1970s and 80s and 90s and like, oh, no, it'll never change, right? It's no, it is changing. It is changing. The, the speed of change is breathtaking, right? It's scary, but it's changing. But you know, not all doom and gloom. There's also opportunity. It of may be opportunity under difficult times. But as you said, and both of you said, if you position yourself with the right asset now and keep your powder dry, and then as you come out the other end and everything is selling at a discount, that's how the real fortunes are made, right? It's not, it's buying, it's Buying at the right time at a low price is where the big fortunes are made. So now is the time to be positioned to get through this meat grinder we're going through. And then you're coming out with the capital and more whole than your financial competitor. And then you can really capitalize. And that's how you get gains that would dwarf just being in the stock market in the 1990s and going up like everybody else, but being at a different level of, of you know, investor. All right, I'm gonna go around the horn here. I think you just covered the one question I saw pop up about the, the US reserve currency status. Uh, and I don't wanna speak for everybody, but I don't think if we continue down this path that it's gonna remain. Uh, we'll hand the torch to the next, whoever that might be. Um, I, I will suggest that there's one possibility that you know we still maintain a majority of the reserve currency status, and that's if we become part of a basket of uh, currencies and commodities of which we can still be like 80, 85% of it, but in effect, it would be a devaluation of the dollar. Um, so that is a possibility. Another possibility, somebody just came in about digital coin or Fed coin. I, I think, uh, you know, I didn't think that the privately held um, uh, cryptocurrencies would succeed to the point where the government feared them. I thought they would squash them before they ever got to that point. And I don't know, we're not there yet, by the way. I don't think the gov any government's scared of cryptocurrencies at this point. I do think they like the technology and they're trying to find a way to switch to that because then they can know everybody's business. They get rid of cash, that dirty money. And, you know, they could tell everything that Hillary's buying, you know, uh, whether she wants them to know or not. I do think that's a real possibility. But um, 
there's been a number of people that have asked for us to give contact information. So I'd like to go one step further. Uh, if we go around the horn, I'll start with Hillary, go to Chris and then myself. If you could just basically wrap up your theme, you know, what's, what's the big exit point you want to leave people with and by all means tell them how to get a hold of you. Cause uh, I think anybody that heard Hillary or Chris, hopefully myself talk tonight would like to hear a little more. Hillary. In my case, it's very simple. You can go to hillarykramer.com and it'll take you right to my website, Game Changer Stocks, one of my seven investment newsletters. And you have the opportunity to receive a free email that we send out, a free newsletter every Friday and talks exactly about the stocks you should know about and that you wanna know about. Uh, so you can get that. That's how you can get in touch with me. And my theme is, I never want you to lose your sleep. I want you to make tons of money. I want you to be ahead of the curve. I don't want anyone ever of my 250,000 subscribers to say that they already heard about people investing in that stock that we recommend. We are first. We're always first. We find them ahead of time. But my message is be careful. Have lots of powder dry. That means cash. That means gold in whatever form that is recommended, you know, between Chris who has um, a vehicle that combines a number of different metals, um, Rich has you know, a number of different ways and understanding to invest based on, as he explained, what the need is, what your interest in is. But for me, hillarykramer.com, we pick the best stocks. That's really what we do. We don't give you lots of verbiage, what we give are the stocks to buy that are going to make you money and everyone loves it because it's fun to make money. Yes, it is. Thank you, <laughs> Hillary. HillaryKramer.com. And Chris? My theme would be we're in an exciting time. I mean, it could be a little unsettling, but um, there is, you know, there's going to be great opportunity like there is at all times and unique opportunities, not the kind that came about for the last 30 years. So the playbook is a little bit different. Um, as far as I'll speak to the precious metals, for those who fear like, oh, you know, they've gone up, it's third leg. Just the fact that such a small percentage of investors are actually in the metals. And we're talking not small, like 25%, we're talking like 1%, 2%. I was gonna say less than 2%. Yes, it is so infinitesimal. And, these, and the physical markets are so small that just a little bit of demand will make the price go way up because you can't just print up gold and silver and platinum and palladium. So my point is, you, it's still early in the game. It really is. And you know, it, it's, it's really come into its own. Um, and also for your own good, work with someone reputable who just understands all the nuances of the metal that can sit with you and talk with you, understand what your goals and objectives are and what would then be the proper form, vehicle, metal type, and, and, and way to hold it. Um, and because they're not, it's not one's right and one's wrong, it's just what's appropriate. Again, my company is Neptune Global or Neptune Global Bullion Exchange. And you could uh, visit us at neptuneglobal.com. That's Neptune like that uh, Greek god who is Greek or uh, Roman, I forget. Um, I think he's Greek. Global.com. So uh, please visit the site. Um, I think you'll find it helpful and you'll, you'll uh, get a good handle on what we're all about. Great. Um, and uh, my parting shot is, I, I think it came out tonight, uh, we're living in uncertain times, so diversity is the key. Uh, and that's not just among different asset classes, but also within asset classes. Uh, you know, Hillary, uh, I encourage you to, to visit her site and subscribe to some of her newsletters. Uh, I, I've only known her a short period of time, but she's unique in that, you know, usually when you talk to a stock person, made their living for 30 years in stocks, you know, they're, they, they dismiss gold because it's counter to what they normally do. Um, it tells me something about her and how she tries to take care of people if she's looking outside the box at all the options available. Like I said about Chris, I've known him for uh, quite some time now and never fails to impress me. Uh, I love the concept of instant diversification. It's something we wrap our arms around. Uh, you can buy it through us, you can buy it directly. The price is gonna 
going to be any different. It's what it's worth. And it's one of the special things about he prices his product and he's all in. Uh, and, you know, yes, by all means, we don't just talk about gold and silver. We buy and sell it here. So if you call us and say, do you buy? The answer is going to be yes, uh, whether we sold it to you or not. Um, I think if you're looking at the metals right now, if you have not taken care of your wealth insurance, my God, what are you waiting for? Do that. Do that yesterday. Okay. If you are considering the for-profit motive, I think you have an incredible amount of distance ahead of us. Um, you know, gold is up what maybe, maybe from the bottom in 2015, Chris, a little over a hundred percent. Okay. Yeah. Um, silver is up from that low point maybe a hundred percent the last two bull markets we're looking at about six seven hundred percent in gold thousand percent in silver that doesn't sound like we're done it sounds like we're just getting started uh so by all means uh enjoy it uh it's one of the few things you can enjoy right now without the government telling you you can do it or not so uh with that i thank you all for attending i know we ran long but i'm sorry i just when i see questions i can't stop at answering them because this is what we're here for um hopefully we delivered some value and thank you so much hillary thank you chris and we look forward to talking with you next quarter great thanks thank you for joining everyone take care hillary